All right, thanks, Joey. Well, time now for a check of our top stories. And Russian troops are continuing to advance on Ukraine's capital, despite the two nations agreeing to begin talks on Monday. Meanwhile, Russia's nuclear force is now on high alert due to what Vladimir Putin called, quote, aggressive statements from the U.S. and its allies. Lauren Podesta is joining us for a report outside of U.N. headquarters in New York, where the General Assembly will convene for an emergency session on Monday. Ukraine set no preconditions in accepting Russia's offer to hold talks today. Delegates from the two nations plan to meet in Belarus at an undisclosed location along the Ukrainian border. Despite the invitation, Russia showed no sign of ending the offensive. A massive convoy of Russian tanks and armored vehicles approached Kyiv last night. The capital city's mayor, former boxer Vitaly Klitschko, had a message for the invaders. Go back home. You have nothing to find here. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky agreed to the sit-down but will not attend it. Zelensky said he doesn't expect any breakthroughs will emerge. Here at the United Nations, diplomats are gathering for a rare emergency session of the General Assembly. They're expected to vote on a resolution calling for peace in Ukraine. Russian leader Vladimir Putin responded to the growing sanctions and condemnation by putting his country's nuclear forces on high alert. Nothing is off the table with this guy. He's willing to use whatever tools he can to uh, intimidate Ukrainians and, and the world. U.N. Ambassador Linda Thomas-Greenfield says the White House is committed to helping Ukraine, but said the U.S. will not send any combat troops there. And the General Assembly has conducted 10 emergency meetings in its history. The last one concerned the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and began on April 24th of 1997. In the meantime, the U.S. Army Reserve in Puerto Rico said they will be sending 150 soldiers to Poland in an effort to join NATO operations. According to a statement, this group of soldiers is prepared to handle heavy military equipment. According to the commander of the U.S. Army Reserve in Puerto Rico, this trip to Poland already planned, was already planned, and, quote, it is not the result of the latest developments between Ukraine and Russia, end quote. In continuing our coverage in Puerto Rico, federal funding is on the way to help repair local highways. Now it's all part of the millions of dollars delegated in federal funds from the U.S. Department of Transportation for highways within U.S. territories. Our Francis Felix reports. Puerto Rico will receive $901 million from federal funds for highway and bridge repairs over the next five years in a statement released from the United States Department of Transportation. During fiscal year 2022, Puerto Rico will receive a total of $173 million from the Federal Highway Administration to cover critical needs of the island road infrastructure. The head of the U.S. Federal Highway Administration, Stephanie Polak, said during a virtual meeting with the media that the funds announced today will help promote major repairs to roads and bridges, in addition to improving the transportation systems in Puerto Rico in general and all other U.S. territories. Pierluis stated that only 13 percent of the highways and roads in Puerto Rico are in good condition, assuring that these are federal statistics. For the governor, these funds are more than welcome after insisting that the island should be treated on equal terms with the rest of the United States. The Secretary of Department of Transportation and Public Works, Aileen Vélez, stated that the funds to which Puerto Rico will have access are vital for the island's transportation system. From San Juan, Puerto Rico. And that was our Francis Felix reporting there. Thank you for that report, Francis. In the meantime, some big news for the entire Caribbean region. A plan's in place to improve access to new treatments for COVID-19. And for many in the region, roaming charges for cell phone users could be a thing of the past. Our One Caribbean News, Deandra Hamilton, explains it all. Your announcements for the Caribbean and the Americas this week in health and technology. First to health. 
The Pan American Health Organization, or PAHO, says it is helping countries in the Americas gain access to new therapeutics which are used to treat and subdue the effects of the coronavirus. Speaking at PAHO's weekly press conference and in response to our question on the issue, Dr. Sylvain Aldegiri said the organization was assessing new therapeutics in conjunction with the WHO. Some products can be considered generic products and may be of importance in ambulatory care for vulnerable groups. I'm thinking about the antivirals, some antivirals. So in this context, really, we urge uh, manufacturers to make uh, available the know-how required for the production of some products, including antivirals, to all countries that need them in this time of pandemic. In a region where getting vaccines continues to be a battle, PAHO now promises to meet with manufacturers to source these new COVID therapeutics. In other news, a declaration has been signed and it could mean lowered to no roaming charges to cell phone users of CARICOM member states. This initiative aims to remove roaming fees and create a single information and communication technology space and seamless Caribbean cell phone use within the region. The Declaration of St. George's, the title of the agreement, is a result of talks initiated in 2021 between Grenadian Prime Minister and CARICOM's lead on science and technology Dr. Keith Mitchell and Digicel and Cable and Wireless. Partially, partially achieved our objective. And that there is still some work to be done as we seek to achieve the optimal position of total elimination of roaming charges. DeAndre Hamilton reporting. All right, thank you, DeAndre. Well, for the first time in two years, there will be a crop over festival. In Barbados, Prime Minister Mia Motley has given the green light for the summer event to take place this year after it was canceled because of the pandemic. But it will not be the usual festival speaking during a pandemic. Over the weekend, the Prime Minister said it would be a modified crop over and outlined changes to many events happening on that day. We've now agreed that we will decentralize this such that we will have at least eight venues that will accommodate persons wanting to play mass for four-day morning and for Grand Kaduman. And it means that those persons who will attend those um, decentralized venues will have to adhere to the same rules that FETs, persons attending FETs, will adhere to over the course of the next few months. We are happy for this because we know that after two years of no crop over and no release, people are more than waiting for this opportunity. We believe that if we have those eight venues properly fenced and with the protocols that we've just announced, that we will be able to welcome not only um, all Barbadians here, but all of the visitors to our island who look forward to this really being one of the first, I almost said carnivals, one of the first more than a carnival type events that can happen in the region having had, of course, to miss those that have been normally would have come in the early part of the year, like Trinidad Carnival and, 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 and others. Now, Prime Minister Motley said consultations to refine the specific events will take place next week. The minimum requirement for attendance will continue to be that people are fully vaccinated or show proof of a negative COVID-19 test taken within 24 hours of the event. The requirement that service providers and technical crew be fully vaccinated and have a negative test also remains in effect.